you again for being here. Uh, my name is Mike Strumpf. I'm the director of Coffee Surf for Swiss Water Decaffeinated Coffee. And um, I'm very happy to be here. I, uh, I end up talking a lot about water activity for some reason. I guess uh, we deal with water more than roasters deal with water because we have water in our name. But also, um, because we hydrate coffee and then dry it back down, we have to pay a lot more attention to the stability of water and the water content of our coffee more so than roasters because you aren't ideally getting your coffee wet. If you are, it's probably a problem. Um, but because of that, and uh, we do a lot of research on water and means we know something about water activity. And we were working with water activity as a measurement for our coffee for years and years before it really started to become more common and popular to talk about in terms of roasting and buying. And so we know a little bit about water activity. I'm not the world's greatest expert. I just might know slightly more than other people. Um, but we can all learn together. And I hope that we have some good questions afterward. Um, and I will talk a little bit about decaf during the presentation, because that is the other word in our name. Um, but the presentation's not focused on decaffeinated coffee. All right. So water activity is a measurement that represents the state of energy of water in a substance, our substance being coffee. But you can use water activity to measure the state of water of any product. And it's commonly used in food science. Um, so another way that you can think about water activity is how loosely or tightly bound the water is in a substance, like how locked in the water is in our coffee beans. The way that you calculate water activity is by measuring the vapor pressure. And so um, the vapor pressure is how much pressure is created in a closed container. So you have to have a closed container to measure your water activity. And then you put your coffee in there. And then how much pressure is built up is the first part. Then you need to divide that by the vapor pressure of pure water, like distilled water. Uh, and this gives us water activity. It's a unitless measure. It goes from 0 to 1. 0 is the most tightly bound water possible. 1 is the most loose water possible, which is pure distilled water. Um, so it, a kinda, it's a hard thing to conceptualize in terms of what it actually means. But like if you think about a cup of water and then a cup of water with a sponge, the water will evaporate slower from the cup of water with a sponge than it will from just the cup of water. And that difference of rate of uh, evaporation is what we're measuring. So you can think of it as vapor pressure. You can think of it as evaporation. Whatever gets it in your head. But it's a measure of how tight the water is in the coffee. So slide. So high vapor pressure means high water activity, which is a high state of energy of water in the coffee. But if we think about this from the perspective of the bean and not the water, high energy water means that the water is loosely bound to the coffee, and low energy water is tightly bound to the coffee. I like to think about it from the bean instead of the water, because we don't deal with water, we, we all roast coffee. So a low energy water state means that your coffee beans are more stable because the water wants to stay in there. And we know that for the life of coffee and for the stability of flavor, the fewer changes it has in terms of moisture and temperature, the better. Right? So if you have a high energy water that's loosely bound in your coffee, the water is more free to come in and go out. And those rapid changes are bad. So why water activity is important is for freshness. Because we buy coffee, say, in May, uh, where it ships from the country. It arrives here in July. And we want it to taste just as good, maybe even better, 
than what it tasted like in, in May. And then we have even further months because we get the coffee in store in July and we need to have it for months while we roast it. But we want it to be stable. And I'm sure we've all had the experience of coffee tasting great as a pre-shipment and tasting not quite as great as an arrival and then just falling off the face of the earth. And it's really disappointing. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help importers. It doesn't help uh, roasters. It doesn't help the people who produce the coffee. So it's really a collective goal to figure out how we make coffee more stable so that it maintains its flavor instead of just dropping off. Now, as I said, water activity is really a measurement used in food science. And there's a lot of small text. You don't have to worry about the exact text on there. Um, but one of the reasons why there's not very much research on, on water activity is because it's just for food science. It's for products and stability. And the companies that have enough money to do research on water activity are multinational food corporations who don't like to publish data on what their research is. So they do research, they store it as internal knowledge, and then it never gets anywhere. Um, but water activity is used in all types of food products because what it represents is shelf life. So like on the bottom, we have some potato chips where the normal range is 0.2 to 0.3. If your potato chips are, have a higher water activity than that, they take on moisture, they'll get soggy, they'll get clumpy, and then they won't last for six months on the shelf. If they have too low of water activity, they're going to be too hard, and then they won't have the pleasurable crunch that we want from, from chips. And so the important thing to remember with water activity is that every product has its own ideal and safe range. So really moist things like fruits and cheeses will have a higher water activity because they have so much more water in there and they just naturally need to have more motion. But if you had dried strawberries, the ideal water activity would be much lower. Um, so stability is one thing. It's very important for stability. The other is for toxin growth. And we will talk more about toxin growth. Um, and it, water activity originally came out as a prediction method for microbial growth, but then people realized later that it could be used in so many different ways. So I want to get back to vapor pressure because vapor pressure is what we're talking about. And I know we probably all took chemistry, but we haven't taken chemistry for quite a while. <laughs> Um, but the way you calculate vapor pressure is by figuring out the amount of gas that you have times uh, a constant, which we don't need to pay too much attention to, times the temperature of what you're measuring versus the volume that it's taking up. And what we learned in school to remember this is the equation PV equals NRT. You don't have to remember any of this. Come on in. <laughs> um, so a typical water activity for green coffee is 0.6. Again, it goes from 0 to 1. So a 0.6 water activity means that the water in the green coffee is 60% as mobile as distilled water. Um, and again, it might not seem like if you put green coffee into a plastic bag, it's going to be evaporating that much water. It might seem insignificant, but it really isn't. It will have quite a bit of transfer from the bean into that closed container. And that's where the ideal gas law comes in. Because we're measuring how much gas at a certain temperature filled up that volume in the bag. Now, that formula is a little more complicated than we really need to pay attention to. We really just need to think about the pressure is the amount of gas times the temperature. 
And temperature is something I'm going to keep talking about and drilling home the entire time that I'm talking to you because it's something that we ignore way too much. Uh, but the really important thing to remember, once we simplify the ideal gas law, pressure, which is what we're measuring for vapor pressure, is the amount of gas at a certain temperature. Now, the reason why this is important is because we never control the temperature or the environment in a container. Right? So as the temperature goes up, if we think about a shipping container that was packed, and it's always super humid where the containers are packed, so there's a lot of moisture in the air. As the temperature goes up, our volume is fixed. So if pressure equals temperature times, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm oversimplifying in my head. Temperature equals amount of gas. Pressure is temperature times amount of gas. As temperature goes up, pressure has to go up. So shipping containers, when, they're, when they go afloat, they go through this cycle of temperature going up and going down which means that the pressure goes through the exact same cycle of going up and going down. And again, those cycles are what cause deterioration of flavor, especially because we had this perfect bean. It was the most beautiful tree. It was cared for perfectly. It was dried down perfectly. And then it just went into a shipping container. And you know, we think about green pro bags as being this wonderful tool for maintaining flavor, but Green Pro bags can have the complete opposite effect. If you have beans that then start giving off moisture, you're just creating a wet bag. So theoretically, they're fantastic. But depending on what type of cycles you go through in that container, it can really have uh, an ill effect on your coffee, which, you know, jute bags aren't perfect. They're, actually, <laughs> they're very far from perfect. But we still haven't found the perfect way to ship coffee. Um, but this is why I've been talking about vapor pressure, because inside of the container, it's closed, it's fixed. As temperature goes up, vapor pressure goes up. Now, the water activity of a typical coffee bean, as I said before, was about 0.6. It's common to see coffee that's been sitting in a steaming container be 0.75 to 0.85. And this is because of the ideal gas law and that building of vapor pressure. But what we have when we have coffees that are that high in, in water activity, if we ignore toxin growth altogether, we have coffee that's highly unstable because the water is so loosely bound in the beans that it just wants to leave or come back or both <laughs> at the same time. But it's a super, super unstable system. And what that means is that our flavor is just going to decline. And this is why shelf life is important for, or why water activity is an important indicator of shelf life and what we can use water activity for in terms of green coffee buying. Because if we, you know, we do everything that we can to get coffee that's stable, but there's too much that's out of our control. We can't control the containers. Even if we buy refrigerated containers, there's still things that are out of our control. So one of the reasons that I find water activity super important for green coffee buying is you can get your coffee landed in store. You take the water activity uh, reading, and then it gives you an indication of how fast you need to use that coffee up before the flavor's gone. If you have two lots arrive at the same time, one that arrives at 0.5, one that arrives at 0.7, water activity tells us use the 0.7 first because the 0.5 will be more stable, it'll last longer, it'll maintain its flavor instead of a complete drop off in cupping score. Water activity is pretty simple, at least in terms of buying green coffee. So that's the shelf life side of it. The toxin growth side is the real deal as well. Um, 
So we've all had containers go bad, I'm sure. If you haven't, you're very lucky. It's kind of like having a roaster fire where like you aren't, you aren't a roaster until you've caught fire, which I think is a horrible thing, but it, it's a little bit true. Uh, you also haven't really bought green coffee until you've had some just awful catastrophic problem go wrong. Really, you know, you grow from these problems. Um, but what happens when you have a container arrive moldy? Whose fault is it? And who's going to take not just control over the situation, but monetary control over the situation? I've run into this problem, which is very, very frustrating, uh, where the coffee must not have been stable before it was put into the container, put in a hot container, goes through the shipping cycles, it arrives, and like half the bags are stained from moisture because the beans let off moisture, created too much moisture inside the container. Then once the temperature cooled down, the water then dripped down on the bags, bags get moldy, coffee inside gets moldy. So then we try and file a claim saying, with the shipping line saying, uh, you know, this coffee was damaged because of time that, where you owned this coffee. Shipping line was in control. This is what insurance is supposed to be for. And the shipping line says, no, the coffee has moisture in it. It's just the problem with the coffee. But it doesn't seem right to then put that back on somebody who you already paid for coffee to say you didn't do a good enough job drying this coffee and you caused it to go bad. So the solution to water activity is not pointing blame. It's really coming up with a good solution that works for everyone because it's, it's, you know, it's not fair to you to, to get a container that's completely damaged, but it's also less fair to, to a farmer to say, I'm going to pay you for only half the container when, you know, we lead mostly comfortable lives and the lives of farmers are much less comfortable than we are. So we need to come up with a solution for the entire supply chain that's equitable to everybody along the way. Now, uh, Unfortunately, we don't grow like chanterelles or some beautiful kind of mushroom that we could like repurpose and upcycle to, to nice restaurants. Um, lots of different things grow. Um, not all fungal growth creates mycotoxins, which are the really harmful things. But also you can have okra toxin without visible mold. So okra toxin is the most common strain of mycotoxin in coffee. And that's the one that we all hear about the regulations for and we all need to worry about. Unfortunately, we can't taste it. It would be nice because we rely on our palates for pretty much everything else. Our tongues are much more sensitive than a pH meter and they're more sensitive than electronic noses, except we can't detect mold. Um, we can see mold sometimes, we can taste mold sometimes, but okra toxin is not visible or tasteable necessarily. So using water activity can be part of a strong purchasing program by setting up limits. And if we, if we think about the standard green coffee contracts that exist, they're all just about moisture content, but not about water activity. And I'm going to talk about the relationship between moisture content and water activity. But the only reliable way to measure or to set like a guideline for I won't buy coffee above this level because it means it's highly likely to be growing toxins, you need to be using water activity and not moisture content. The other thing you could do if you don't want to measure uh, water activity is to buy equipment so that you can do your own okra toxin testing. Uh, I don't recommend going that route. It's more expensive than water activity meters and it's more complicated. Uh, but if you want a bulletproof solution to making sure that you don't have coffee with okra toxin, then that really is the way to go. So above 0.72 is where green coffee is likely to start growing mycotoxins. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it will, it just means likely. And this is where the gray zone happens. Uh, we actually just had some coffee arrive uh, 
that was wetter than it should be, water activity well above 0.7, but we put it through ochre toxin testing and it was completely fine. So the coffee was fine, we accepted it, all's good. But it could have gone the other way. So playing it safe, making a strong green coffee buying program, using water activity is a nice way to just create a baseline and say, I'm not gonna buy coffee above this level. The tricky part is contracting that so that your delightful importer is on the same page. And that's part of what we need to do in terms of disseminating information about water activity throughout the entire supply chain. Because once you convince your importer of that, they have to convince the exporter and the exporter has to convince the farmer, the co-op, that this is something that actually needs to be paid attention to. And if, we, if you've traveled to coffee origin countries, you've seen not everybody even has water uh, moisture meters or the moisture meters are busted or whatever. And it's not really reasonable to expect everybody in your supply chain to start buying water activity meters, especially once you look up how much they cost. Uh, so it's, it's less of a solution to say everybody needs to buy water activity meters, but come up with a collaborative solution so that everybody understands what you're talking about and what level you expect, and then working with people to understand how you get there instead of just saying, you need to buy this and do this for me. All right. So thinking about ochre toxin levels, uh, the EU has a regulation that roasted coffee can have no more than five parts per billion of ochre toxin. And this is a consumer facing regulation, right? Because it's on roasted coffee. So it has nothing to do with green coffee. But we buy green coffee, so we have to figure this out from the green coffee side of things. So in 2005, the International Coffee Organization, the ICO, created an OTA or ochre toxin A risk management guideline. So they surveyed the scientific research on deterioration of ochre toxin A in roasting. And of course, there's no easy answer because coffee can never have just an easy answer that's applied to everything. But the scientific research showed that reduction during roasting is somewhere between 69 and 96%. So it doesn't kill ochre toxin altogether, but it can significantly really reduce it. So if we go on the really, uh, cautious side and say it's going to have 69% reduction, that means that we should have green coffee with no more than 7 to 10 parts per billion of ochre toxin A to hit that 5 parts per billion roasted limit. This is only important if you're sending your coffee out to a lab to be tested for ochre toxin A, but really if, <laughs> like I, I try and be very, very reasonable. Uh, rejecting a container, rejecting a lot of coffee is so detrimental to people in the supply chain. I will do everything that I can to not do that. So like this container that just arrived, instead of saying it's above 13%, we're just rejecting it straight away. We went through the steps of sending it out for testing, making sure that everything is actually fine and above board. It was less than seven to 10, we're good to go and we'll just use up the coffee quickly because we know it's high water activity and the flavor is gonna degrade quickly. All right, so water, act, er, the drying stage is often thought of as the most critical post-harvesting step in coffee. Um, and it's thought in general that lower drying temperatures will create and preserve, uh, will create a more stable coffee and preserve the quality as much as possible. Um, so, there's no hard and fast rules, as always, with drying coffee because it depends so much on the temperature of the environment and sunlight, rain, all these other things. But we know that coffee should not be held for too long at high water activity. So we can't just dry it at as cool of temperature as possible because once it starts to grow toxins, you never get rid of those toxins, not even with roasting. So the coffee has to be dried down fast enough so that it's not growing toxins, but not so fast that you're really damaging coffee. Um, 
Now, there's a lot that goes into drying, obviously, but one really, really important thing is knowing the humidity, more so than the temperature where the coffee is dried. The humidity where the coffee is dried is what will set the water activity. Because another way to think about water activity is the relative humidity divided by 100. So if it's 60% relative humidity in the air, products will equilibrate to 0.6 water activity. So these types of uh, closed beds can actually be detrimental because it's locking in. And if it's hot, you create too much moisture, your relative humidity is too high, and you'll get dried coffee. But you'll get dried coffee at 10% with 0.7 water activity or higher because the relative humidity where you were drying it is too high. And so this is, if we think about what we see in uh, areas where there's too much rainfall during drying seasons, like northern Peru or Indonesia, where they have to put tarps over the coffee as it's drying, that's what's happening. They're creating like a cocoon where it just harbors problems and relative humidity and temperature, and that drives the vapor pressure up. So the application of better drying is really on a case-by-case -case basis. And to me, this is something that we can communicate. And I, I'm not an expert on drying. I'm not an expert on growing. I can't even keep plants alive in my house. Um, so I'm not one to go and work with people in the supply chain and say, this is how you should be doing things or try this. But what we do know is that when coffee is too moist, it doesn't dry properly. And it's a pretty safe thing to try and communicate to people. You know, parabolic dryers are fantastic unless they trap too much moisture in there. So you need some amount of airflow. And that's why raised beds are fantastic because they get airflow going unless you cover them completely. All right. So we know that the compounds of flavor are bound inside the green coffee, and they're susceptible to escape through degradation over time. Um, and so storage conditions are extremely important. And there almost is a smoking gun for storage conditions. It's pretty well accepted that uh, about 65% relative humidity at about 65 Fahrenheit, which is, I don't know, 17 Celsius-ish. It's a nice, stable place. Your coffee's happy. It's great. Um, I used to live in a really dry, arid place, and we had humidifiers in our green coffee storage because if you kept the coffee in there for a month, it would dry out by one, one whole percentage point. Um, so we know stability, we can tell from water activity because if the moisture is not bound enough, it leaves. We know that yeasts and molds can grow because of too high of water activity. What we haven't talked about yet are the effects on roasting. And this is where it gets really interesting because this is moving from like green coffee importers having water activity meters to roasters having water activity meters. So we all know it's very important to have Maillard reactions. That's what creates the amazing flavors of coffee. What is really, really interesting about moisture content and water activity and Maillard reactions is that you need a certain amount of moisture and a certain amount of free moisture to have those reactions happen. What's almost counterintuitive is that high water activity gives you the ability to have more Maillard reactions. But it's a double edge because it also means that those are going to disappear faster. So we have a maximum amount of Maillard reactions taking place between 0.6 and 0.7 water activity. Though that's not necessarily the best area for stability of our coffee. So, you know, it's uh, everything's a trade-off, and I wish it wasn't, 
I wish there was just some really easy thing that we could communicate. Not that anyone could even hit it if we did communicate the perfect water activity. But there's no exact right number. So above 0.7 is the danger zone for toxin growth. If we get down in here, we have increased shelf life. If we're in here, we have increased uh, Maillard reactions available. So that's why I was communicating 0.6 is kind of the average water activity. Because it's not the best of any case, but it's kind of the best of all cases. Your coffee will be stable. You'll have Maillard reactions available. But it's not going to be the most stable, and you won't have the most Maillard reactions available. But, you know, you, you take the good, you take the bad, and then we have a container of coffee. All right. This is a, not the best summary. There's a lot of words on there. <laughs> I won't just read them off, I promise. Um, the gist of it is that coffee and water are complex, and the relationship between coffee and water are complex. And we eventually add water to brewing the coffee, and it gets even more complex. Um, but drying the coffee at origin is really, really important. Moisture content is helpful, but it doesn't tell you how bound that moisture is in the coffee. Water activity can help predict safety and stability. How you apply it is unfortunately just up to you. <laughs> um, and you know, I, in the last point, I bring up water activity for pre-shipment samples. And this is a kind of polarizing topic. And uh, people that I know, some of them bring water activity meters uh, down to origin when they go visit during like harvest and milling time. But you know, pre-shipment samples aren't the full sample. They aren't necessarily rested. They might have been sitting in an office for a little while. They aren't necessarily the best representation. But the more data points you get, the better. You know, you can have data and ignore it, but if you don't have the data at all, you're flying blind. Okay, I said I was going to talk about decaf, and I should talk about decaf just a little bit. So some people like to say that drying at origin is the most critical step in coffee quality post-harvest. I like to say decaffeination is. Uh, what we do is we rehydrate the beans. So the, the beans come off the tree at about 50% moisture. In every decaffeination process, you have to rehydrate your coffee, and it naturally goes back to about 50% moisture. And then we have to dry the coffee back down. Now, what we do is we dry coffee back down to the level that we know is stable. It doesn't matter if the coffee comes in at 8% or 13%. We dry the coffee down to the level that we know can ship and not grow toxins and be as stable as possible. It's not the original moisture content. Uh, all decaffeinators that I know of use mechanical drying. Uh, nobody's out in Hamburg, like on a, on a patio on their roof, raking the beans. It would be quite cute. Uh, but it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in Canada either. Um, so it's all mechanically done. But there's no parchment. And the parchment's really important in drying coffee at origin because it creates a really nice barrier for the coffee beans. It protects them. It's like a nice little sleeping bag. But we aren't so lucky in decaffeinated coffee. The parchment's already gone. So we have to be very, very careful in in decaf when we're drying the coffee down. We also have to be careful because the coffee has gone through wetting twice. And we know from what I was just saying before, when you, when you have dried coffee and it gets wet, it's bad for quality, unless you do it in a controlled way. If it's controlled, it's not necessarily detrimental to coffee, but it really can go wrong. And uh, I like to think that in drying, you can't make the coffee any better you can just significantly ruin it. 
So we try not to do that. Um, yeah, but we evaluate water activity in decaf the exact same way using the same meters. No problems at all. Okay, a little bit more about water activity in roasting coffee. Um, so I like to think of like the triple threat of meters that you can have is a water activity meter, a density meter, and a moisture meter. No one of those indications alone will tell you what you need to know about roasting coffee. I mean, even all three of them might not tell you exactly what you need to know. But when you have that much data, you can get a good picture. So I like to think about how much energy I need to put into the coffee for it to, to properly dry out and then properly create browning reactions. So high water activity means that it's going to be easy to push that water out. Because in roasting, we're trying to boil the water so that it evaporates. If that water readily moves, you need to put less energy in, water will evaporate. If you have a high density coffee, it means that you have to put more energy in to get to that water, right? So you have to have high energy for high density coffee. And then there's differing opinions on high moisture content. Some people take the approach of high moisture content means you need to put less energy in because it's going to be uh, easy to evaporate. But some people take the opposite approach and they say just hit it really, really hard and then flash off the moisture. I'm not here to tell anybody how to roast coffee. I have my ways that I like to roast coffee. Everybody has their own ways that they like to do things. Um, but no one of those indications on their own will tell you what you need to know. Because high density doesn't mean high water activity or low water activity. High moisture content also doesn't mean high water activity or low water activity. And then creating, using those three points of data, what you want to do with a coffee is up to you. And then it's up to you also to see how does that coffee age over time as it's sitting in your warehouse or sitting in an outside warehouse. What's happening to the moisture content? What's happening to the density? What's happening to the water activity? Because they all work together too. As your moisture content goes down, your density inherently goes up because you're losing weight, but the bean stays the same size. Right? So none of these things work independently, and that's why you have to have more points of data and more meters to measure with. Now, this information is from uh, Chris Corman at Royal Coffee in California. He's been writing some really great research, uh, not just on water activity, but on a lot of topics. If you ever have some spare time, you can go to their blog and read what he writes about. He did a really neat research project on the Maillard reactions in roasted coffee. So we know that in roasting, the rate of the Maillard reaction will affect not just the sweetness, but acidity and the body of the coffee. What he figured out through this research is that the water activity based on the fact that you can have more Maillard reactions with higher water activity, affects not just the color of the, of the reactions, but the rate of the reactions. That's where it gets really confusing about how much energy you want to put in. So I really liked the conclusions that he drew from, from his research, so I wanted to talk about them. So high water activity may have an increased rate of Maillard reactions and may respond more quickly to heat. But of course, it's dependent on the density of the coffee. It may have acidity that's more resilient to heat in the sense that uh, usually a faster roast has higher perceived acidity and a slower roast has lower perceived acidity. But what he found is that the acidity might be more flexible in a high water activity coffee. Next point, also super interesting, is that the high water activity had a more predictable temperature and time of first crack, which is really, really interesting. It doesn't have any effect on flavor, but that's 
one of the reasons why roasting is so damn confusing. <laughs> we try and set up quality control programs where we say first crack times, but that first crack time is related to water activity. And because of the increased rate of Maillard reactions, you can have darker colors at the same end temperature and time. So this, all of his research is like too much for me to comprehend because you can never get any concrete conclusions, but just so many interesting things to think about um, and thinking about it as your coffee ages over time once it lands and it stabilizes or starts to lose moisture or go down in water activity, what do you need to do to change your roasting? Because your roasting profile can't stay the same over four months. We have to be changing things. So the biggest takeaway from, for me from this research was that higher water activity can give faster Maillard reactions, which can give higher sweetness acidity and more viscosity in the body. But again, too high, and then you're hitting the detrimental factors in coffee. Uh, now, how do you measure water activity practically? because nobody's actually taking the vapor pressure of anything. We have handheld tools or benchtop tools for water activity meters. Um, and so we have one of these for our activity later. Um, the brand is called Decagon. This over here is another style of handheld meter uh, from Rotronic. And instead of actually measuring the vapor pressure, they use a capacitance reader, similar to uh, the moisture meters that we're all used to. And these are highly portable. These are the types of things that people will bring if they're traveling down to a coffee origin and they want to bring a water activity meter with them. They bring that. They don't bring like a heavy bench top machine with them. Now, this is, uh, I think, the rest of the presentation. I hope that I keep you interested. <laughs> this is where I get a little bit nerdy, um, but this is uh, one of the things that I really like is how these things work. So I mentioned they read capacitance. And um, capacitance is the ability to store an electrical charge. Uh, now, any object that can be electrically charged exhibits some amount of capacitance. And it's just how much energy can it hold. Uh, it's measured in terms of farads. So it's the capacitance across which, when charged with one coulomb, there's a potential difference of one volt. You don't need to, to remember any of these things. It's like the formulas that I showed you before. It's just to make me seem smart. Um, but capacitors are really important because that's what's used in uh, both water activity meters and in moisture meters. So first I'll talk about how these things work in water activity meters. So they use thin film capacitive sensors, um, which like if you think about it, it's kind of measuring how much moisture is on that uh, thin film capacitor because you have your closed container where you put your coffee in, water starts to evaporate, there's a sensor at the top, and then the sensor measures how much water is on there. But it doesn't like count how many bubbles of water on, are on there. It's calculating the capacitance. So water conducts electricity, right? Water is the best conductor of, uh, of electricity in the world. More water is more conductivity. More conductivity is less capacitance because it conducts electricity so well. So the more water that evaporates from the beans onto that sensor means lower capacitance, which means higher water activity. You don't have to remember this. I find it very neat because I like all the shows on how things work. Um, and that's how they work because it's not measuring the actual like, amount of water in there. And it's also not measuring the vapor pressure. That would be the primary method for calculating uh, the water activity, but your meter would have to be so much more complicated. <laughs> so it just measures the capacitance. Now, uh, 
the reason why you want both a moisture meter and a water activity meter is because there's not a direct correlation between water activity and moisture content. There's the moisture sorption isotherm, and that's what we have over here. So what it means is as coffee is absorbing moisture, it'll follow one curve, and as it's releasing moisture, it follows a different curve. So here we have moisture percentage and water activity. So at any given water activity, if we look at water activity of 0.6, we could have moisture content 8, or we could have moisture content 15. And this is why we can't just have one meter to tell us what we need to know. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. I really wish it did. Um, to make things even more complicated, and to again bring it back to decaf, I have this graph over here, where this is tracking the relationship between moisture content and water activity on the top for green coffee and on the bottom for decaf. So decaf coffee and green coffee have a different sorption isotherm. So it's even more reason why we really need water activity as a measurement at Swiss water and why I think it's important for uh, people to use water activity at their roasting. Now, this is the really important one. I think the rest of the talk is about temperature. <laughs> So this isotherm is at a fixed temperature. This was done at 20 degrees Celsius. But why is that constant temperature important? You know, it harkens back to the ideal gas law where it's pressure times temperature. More, th more calculations here. And you really don't have to pay attention to these. It's getting worse and worse and worse. I'm just <laughs> diving further down the hole. Uh, this is, if you actually wanted to calculate a moisture sorption isotherm, this is how you would do it. The better way is to just practically test it, where you take your coffee bean at a given moisture, figure out what the water activity is, do it at a different moisture, figure out what the water activity is. If you really like formulas, uh, you can actually calculate the water sorption isotherm, but please don't. Now, moisture meters, and I promise I'll come back to temperature. Uh, these are much more common for roasters to have and for um, origin operations to have, where they measure the amount of moisture in a substance, our substance being coffee. Similar to the water activity meter, where this is a secondary test, the primary method of water activity measurement is through vapor pressure. The primary method of measuring moisture content is through oven drying, but it takes a really long time. You're drying your coffee for over 12 hours, and so when you get in 10 pre-shipment samples, nobody's putting them in an oven and waiting 12 hours. You want an answer in a minute. So this secondary method is a capacitance meter, and now that we all know what capacitors are, we're good to go, and we all understand completely how this thing works. That, that was supposed to be a joke, so it worked. <laughs> this is where it gets even more complicated because it's not just how much capacitance does a substance hold or where that substance is water. Our substance is now coffee. And so we have to worry about the dielectric constant. The dielectric constant is the capacitance of a substance that's not water. Well, Water has a dielectric constant as well, but that's what's used as like the standard. So if you think about like the ability of uh, wood, dry wood versus the ability for a wire, like copper wire, they're gonna hold charge and transfer charge differently. The charge is gonna transfer much more fast through a copper wire than it will through a piece of wood. Though the piece of wood will transfer and hold some electricity. So different materials have different dielectric constants. Our material being coffee. But different coffees have different dielectric constants because it depends on their density, the ability of the moisture to come out of the coffee, and how it was dried. So 
what this means for water activity meters, or for uh, moisture meters, sorry, is that they have different programmed curves. Because the moisture meters that I just showed and that we have in our labs, they can read the moisture of many, many different products. They could read wheat, they could read soybeans, they could read barley, they could read malt, they could read coffee. All these products have different dielectric constants. And then the moisture meters have different programmed curves. Now we just use whatever Sinar says is this is the curve for green coffee and we accept that because Sinar is full of very smart people. There's no doubting that. But not all green coffees have the same dielectric constants. So if you were a very picky particular person, you could create different curves for let's say different origins, or if you want to get really, really picky, different co-ops, different crop years. Go through a process like the moisture sorption isotherm of put your coffee in the oven, test it out, see where the curve goes, make calculations, all that kind of stuff. Um, but nobody's actually doing that because it's a, it's a little bit of a waste of time and it's a huge rabbit hole. Uh, but an important thing to think about is what this means for decaf. Again, because I work for Swiss Water Decaf. Decaffeinated coffee, because it's been rehydrated and dried down, will have a different dielectric constant than the coffee before drying. So what does this mean about our moisture meter? If we're just using the same curve, it means that we're reading the wrong moisture content of decaffeinated coffee because it doesn't follow the same curve of dielectric constant. Some of them have pre-programmed decaffeinated coffee curves in there, which maybe it's right, maybe it's not. Uh, it's probably a better guesstimate than using the green coffee curve, but it's just something to be aware of because we all, we buy coffee, we take the moisture content. If it's too low, we reject it, or if it's too low, we make up something in our head about what that coffee's gonna taste like because we're all just humans. Um, but it's not necessarily the right uh, reading. Now, I said I was gonna talk more about temperature and I will right now. So the rate at which water evaporates is dependent on temperature and that's what's important for water activity. The temperature of products affects the dielectric constant. And this is where it really gets screwy. So you should be using a consistent temperature for measuring water activity and for uh, moisture content. So this research that was done, you can tell by the font that the research is very, very old. <laughs> it was from 1978 <laughs> when they didn't have quite as many fonts as we have now. Um, so what this research showed was that at 25 degrees Celsius, a 0.1 Celsius difference in temperature uh, in the sample led to a 0 0.005 uh, percent difference. Now it doesn't seem like a lot, but that was only a 0.1 Celsius change. If we think about two degrees Celsius or five degrees Celsius, that's when we're seeing real big impacts on the readings that we're getting. And so this temperature is extremely important for both moisture content and for water activity. So we have two options. We have creating a protocol where we're always measuring at the exact same temperature, which I think is the right way to go, or there's buying really, really expensive meters that heat up and cool down your coffee for you. And that's one of the differences between super expensive meters and these handheld ones, is a super expensive water activity meter has a heater, it has a cooler, so that you always read at the same temperature, and it gives you a very, very exact reading. But normal human being ones don't have that. Same thing with uh, moisture meters. If you're reading the moisture of a coffee at 30 degrees Celsius one day, and you get in another coffee and it's at 15 degrees, your, your readings aren't comparable because you're changing too many variables, your dielectric constant is changing. So I, I kind of preach about this a lot because I've worked in a cupping room for so many years and that's what I really like to do. 
and I, we all put so much emphasis on these numbers that we get. But if we don't have good protocols for getting these numbers, they aren't believable. And once we start passing not believable information, if we're doing that across our entire supply chain, that means we're just like passing bad information further and further. And so I would like all of us to avoid doing that and to create good protocols for using our equipment and collecting our data, such as having consistent temperatures and also taking multiple readings because these capacitors aren't perfect. And if you've taken the moisture content of the same coffee over and over, you'll see that they change a little bit. So another best practice is to take, say, three readings of everything, average them together, and you get a more reliable number. What we're working toward in all of this is more reliability of our stability of coffee, of our flavor of coffee, of our data. Um, and we just need to take care because of everybody in our supply chain. Because it all comes back to people. Uh, and that is it.